I'm a first generation Iranian American. So much like any child, we're sort of been negotiating with our parents our entire life. Um, at some point I said, you know, I may live a life of disappointment with them. This is maybe something they're never gonna be happy with, but I sort of stood in my truth. At the end of the day, you have to just stand in your, your power. You have to stand in your values. When we talk about sort of these win-win negotiations, it doesn't mean they get everything they want, you get everything you want. It's truly compromise. And I think we compromise, to be successful, you compromise only the things that really are not as meaningful to you, but maybe more meaningful to the other person. Today, I'm interviewing Maury Taharapur. She's an expert in negotiating and helps people find deeper meaning in their lives and careers. In this episode, we're talking primarily about how to develop your negotiating skills to use them in everyday situations, whether it's negotiating a raise or having a difficult conversation with your partner. I'm Erica Kohlberg. This is Erica Taught Me, and I'm here with Maury Taharapur. So you're an expert in negotiation, but I'm curious, what's the hardest negotiation you personally have ever had to go through? Yeah, you know, most people would expect I would talk about sort of a business negotiations or some transaction, but, you know, I should sort of back up. The way I see negotiations is I always say it's like the soundtrack of our lives. It's something that we do every day, all day. The, I'm a first generation Iranian American, so much like any child who's the daughter or, or son of immigrants. We're sort of been negotiating with our parents our entire life. Um, and I would say probably, and this is as I was I'm sitting here thinking about it, I would say the first time I wanted to actually tell my parents that I didn't want to go to med school, the negotiations with myself that probably led up to that, I was quite young at that point. But I remember how difficult it was because it was honoring my own values, finally having the courage to do that, not knowing what the fallout's gonna be, and then having a really hard conversation with people that you really care about and sort of drawing your boundaries. And that's sort of the heart of any negotiations that we do in our life, right? So every part of what I just laid out was excruciating because again, you worry about the other side. I, I worried about disappointing them. Um, I worried about disappointing myself if I didn't do it. And so that push pull, I think became maybe one of the most difficult negotiations. It set me up, I think, for the rest of my life, honestly. And it was the most freeing in some ways. But it's interesting that the hardest negotiations are usually where the other party is someone or that you care so deeply about. Because then there are just those expectations of, am I going to disappoint my parents? How are they going to feel? I know when I left the law firm, that was the, it wasn't a negotiation because I had really made up my mind that I was going to leave. And I wanted, I just wanted their approval and validation to say, okay, we, we believe in you. We trust you. But that was so difficult for me because I felt like they had sacrificed everything their whole lives to get me to that place where I could go to law school and become this lawyer. And I felt just like such a disappointment to them. Yeah. And it's funny. I, I hope you got the validation that I never got. Uh, but it was that, right? They sacrificed everything, left our country to come to the U.S. because I was so young, they couldn't sort of ship me up by myself. We moved to the States at the brink of the revolution in Iran. Um, so I was, I was very young. I was like seven years old. So, you know, at that moment where you're about to have this conversation, you're thinking, but they did this all for you. But again, it's freeing because at some point you have to realize that you're living the rest of your life still, right? And you have a whole life to live. You have dreams and ambitions and you only pray that those two things, right? Their expectations and your sort of wants and needs, your interests don't come into conflict. Mm -hmm. But they did for me. And then it became this notion of sort of continued self-advocacy in some ways. Um, at some point I said, you know, I may live a life of disappointment with them, right? I may, this, this is maybe something they're never gonna be happy with, but I sort of stood in my truth. Um, and I think that that's probably, especially when there's emotionality, when you have these ties with people that you care about, at some point you have to realize that if you don't do that, right? If you don't speak your truth, if you don't draw those boundaries, then you'll end up resenting them, you know, and maybe even resenting yourself for not doing it. And I think that's what's freeing, right? Because I actually don't resent my parents for any of this, right? I now understand 
that they did it out of love. They, they want the best for you, right? They have dreams for you. Just because you don't embrace those dreams for yourself, it doesn't mean that they didn't love you all the same, right? So what the life that they imagined for me was probably very different than, than I know is very different than the life I live now. But again, I'm not angry. I just, I'm, I feel like this is what I had to do. And, and you know, at whatever the stakes are, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you have to just stand in your, your power. You have to stand in your values. Yeah. And so what was the immediate reaction to the negotiation you had with them, letting them know that you didn't want to go to med school? Uh, my father was very angry for a very long time. Very long time. Years? Years. Actually, the first time he was really angry with me was I was still in college. I hadn't even decided that I was not going to go to med school. I literally just said, I'm questioning whether... Yeah, we didn't speak to each other for a very long time. And uh, he was very upset with me. But again, it's taken all this time for me to look back and say, I get it. I, you know, I, I, I understand. Um, we all love differently and, you know, we all receive love differently. But frankly, his way of love is very different than my mom's way of showing me love, right? So she was much more compassionate and empathetic his was sort of dreams shattered because he couldn't go to med school because his mom didn't want him to travel abroad. I have two siblings. My brother didn't go to med school. My sister didn't go to med school. I was like the last hope. <laughs> and so I think it just took much longer for him to get over it. I don't know if he's actually got, still gotten over it, but it is what it is. What would it indicate to you that he has gotten over it? They are both sort of living um, with dementia at this point, but... Um, so it's sort of hard to even decipher that now. But I think it's just the little things, right? You know, if we're out somewhere and somebody has some kind of an emergency, I swear it used to be, if only you had gone to med school, <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> you could have helped. But, you know, it's those little things that were like stuck into the conversation or, oh, so-and-so's child just went to med school and they're so, they're so successful or even dentists, right? Oh, she's such a great dentist. And, you know, they go on and on and on. And you just know it's hopes and prayers that were never answered. But. Yeah. It's interesting how parents have these set expectations for us. And then, you know, I also wanted to go to med school. I wanted to be a doctor to help people. And then it was halfway into college that... I took this class called organic chemistry. I realized I was horrific at it. It was my first C in my life. And I was just like, okay, this isn't going to work out. So I had to tell my parents. But to lessen the fall, I said, well, I'm not going to be a, a doctor, but I think I'll be a lawyer. A lawyer? <laughs> so, the second best thing you could do, yes. Yeah. So that was my compromise to make my parents happy. And ultimately, it, it worked out. I love that being a lawyer, you can equally help people. But right. In a different way. Yeah, it's, it's not what they envisioned. Exactly. I think when coming to negotiations, everyone wants a concrete outcome and a feeling of closure. But for that negotiation that you had with your parents, it sounds like you still don't have that feeling of closure. How do you deal with that in negotiation? Well, first of all, you have to be really clear about what it is that you want, right? We so often put our needs aside. You know, I talk about sort of pleasers in my book. And these are sort of people that want to be of service to other people, right? Their goal is to make others happy. And the mistake that's often made is that, you know, their happiness has to mean your unhappiness because those two things are not mutually inclusive. And in some ways, you know, when we talk about sort of these win-win negotiations, it doesn't mean they get everything they want, you get everything you want. It's truly compromise. And I think we compromise, to be successful, you compromise only the things that really are not as meaningful to you, but maybe more meaningful to the other person. Because if you negotiated away your, what I call your non-negotiables, then no matter what the outcome, you wouldn't be happy anyway. So it's that notion of creating that sort of internal balance, if you will, right? That sort of inner critic, inner dialogue that we have that says, you know, as you weigh this over time that, yeah, the decisions I made were the right ones. And, you know, we talk a lot about sort of preparation and negotiations. And I think one of the reasons why, besides sort of being more prepared makes you more confident and all that, it's also that, you know, even like tests that you would take in school, right? If you don't do as well as you want, 
at least you say I was fully prepared for it, right? You can't then sort of be angry at yourself for not doing your best. And I think it's the same thing with us, right? You say, at least I stood again in my truth, right? And and I communicated, as difficult as it was, I communicated my needs and in some ways created ultimately some sort of a compromise because, you know, if the end result is they want you to be happy too, it's just that life isn't going to be what you both exactly imagined, then I think it becomes sort of this journey, right? In these situations where there's relationships involved, whether you're married, your kids, what have you, there's no sort of end result, right? This is life. And I think as we navigate it, those conversations come up all the time. And you have to find sort of that, and sometimes it's not middle ground. Sometimes it's more towards them than you, but it shifts. It's sort of this, this kind of ultimate balance that you create. but. You have to honor yourself, I think, because that's ultimately what we can't live with, right? If you look in the mirror and you're sort of, yeah, this didn't turn out exactly but with what I wanted, but I did something that was difficult and, and I feel better for it. I feel freer for it. When you're negotiating, I'm sure there are elements that you can put in your favor. So for example, if you're negotiating with your partner, don't do it while they're angry or have had a rough day right. at work already. What else can we people obviously do to set themselves up for a more fruitful negotiation? Let me just say, I mean, we've talked a lot about sort of family, but every, you know, when I teach negotiations or any kind of negotiation strategy really applies to both your personal life and professional life. There's you know, I don't teach a class on personal relationship negotiations, right? So it's all, the foundations are all the same, right? The emotionality makes them different, but or the relationships, but the foundations are all the same. And I think one of the most important things is this notion of sort of a mindset, a learning mindset. We are oftentimes so sure of the outcomes that we want, that we sort of lose curiosity, right? And then we start leading with with sort of certainty. And I think the minute that happens, then no matter again, how prepared you are, right? How ready you are for the conversation, you, you don't allow room for growth within that conversation, right? So as we're talking to people, you're sort of, if you're sort of emotionally intelligent, that's really what you were talking about, right? The right time, the right date, and really sort of the right environment and circumstance. That's all really important, but as you're in it is really, really important, right? To be completely mindful and to be completely present and to be incredibly curious, right? That's why sort of the power of empathy in negotiations is just that, right? You, as confident as you are, you can't believe that you possibly know everything. And you leave that room to both understand where the other person is coming from, right? That whole walking in somebody's shoes is, is really to understand sort of how they got here, what they want, what they need, what moves them, what motivates them. and to be able to sort of actively take that in, because this is not a passive dialogue, allows you to grow and change and become smarter in that conversation because you've left that room for curiosity. Um, so I think that's really, really important is not to ever think you know everything, right? Because oftentimes you may surprise yourself at the end of the conversation, you may end up in a far better place than you ever even imagined. Um, that comes with sort of leaving that, that room to learn. And the curiosity part you bring up is so interesting because a lot of times people will go into these negotiations and think they know the motives or what the other side wants out of the outcome when really they don't. But if they were curious, they could start to learn more by asking the right questions. And something I thought you said that was brilliant in another podcast interview or your book, I forget where I read it. It was basically, if someone says no to you, instead of thinking that's closed, it's the end of the negotiation, ask them like, what would make it not a no? Right. So if it, if this current scenario we're talking about is a no, like what would make it a yes, right? Yeah, it's it's funny because, you know, it's all the short words that get us in trouble. Our ego and this two letter word no that we take as like absolute defeat and personal rejection. And the truth is that you haven't really walked into a wall, right? You need to sort of appreciate, right, the circumstances of that person, right? So even if it's a raise that you're asking for and your boss says, no, we can't do this right now, or no, it just, no, like this is impossible. Then if you don't take this as a personal rejection, the next question, right? Or the next approach is, I understand 
would there be a better time? Can we put this conversation off for another six months? Is there something that I can do better to, you know, make this an easier ask for you and HR, perhaps? What can I do to help? And as you, so when once you hear that word, no, you're not like, oh my God, this is the end as I know it, right? It's the why, not in a way that appears like you're interrogating them, but in a way that says, how can I make you more comfortable on this, right? How can I help you get to a place where you can say, okay, or you can say yes. And it creates almost immediately the sort of collaborative problem solving approach to it as opposed to you having this sort of defeatist attitude. And I think it's that's really all about mindset, right? The other part of it is coming in prepared to offer those alternatives, right? It's really the ultimate sort of scenario planning. And no matter, again, who you're doing this, whether it's a family member, or whether it's, it's a professional relationship, all that we can prepare ahead of time is almost two-dimensional, unless you know the person really well, right? You've Googled them, you've learned about them, or you know, they sort of you haven't really peeled back all the layers of that onion. So you can sort of imagine um, or even make some assumptions about what their interests are, what their response to you is going to be. But until you actually test that in the conversation, you don't really know, right? So rather than thinking, I've made a decision, this is what I think they want, and walking in only in that lane. If you say, I, I'm thinking these may be some of the things that are important to them. Let me sort of proceed with this conversation in a way that tells me, yeah, this was true. No, this assumption of yours didn't work. Maybe I need to learn more before I even go back to my assumption. So you're really prepared for those things, but you're also open the entire time. That's so interesting. So it's almost like you're walking in having your ideal outcome in mind, but then all of these variations of the ideal outcome so that you ultimately can give them more choice. Absolutely. It rarely does your bottom line change, right? Our bottom lines are sort of those Mm non-negotiables, if you will. But things like your goals, right, that you want to achieve, those should stay malleable. Um, You know, you, you should absolutely be aspirational. But again, being so present in this conversation, you know, being where your feet are, right? That, that whole time as you're getting information, you're processing. And oh, by the way, you could say, you know, maybe we should pick this conversation up another time. I want to think a little bit more about this. Maybe I can come back with, with some alternatives for you that you may find more appropriate. Um, and I think that's, a more thoughtful approach. Again, you sort of check the ego and say, this wasn't a rejection of you. This just doesn't work for them. Um, Maybe there's a better way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times for the specific example of asking your boss for a raise, your boss may not be the final decision maker. So you're ultimately trying to empower your boss to be able to advocate on your behalf. And the more choice and optionality you can give them, I assume the better potential outcome for you. Absolutely. And even if your boss is their own boss, right? If they're a small business owner or an entrepreneur, it's still circumstances that they're in that affects their decision-making, right? So it's still that level of empathy and curiosity. So again, I think this notion of how we internalize, right? So this is where imposter syndrome comes in and all of that, how we internalize the response that we got and how we process that, the door is not shut. This is all about what you can do to maybe make this an easier decision for them. And look, maybe it's just not right now, right? It could be timing. Um, It could be a variety of things. But the minute you think, oh God, that didn't work. And, you know, no is that final response. Everything I feel like sort of tumbles down, right? At that moment, you check your ego at the door and you go in saying, we're gonna, we're gonna work this out somehow. And if at the end of the, you couldn't do it, it's still a question of time, or maybe this isn't the right company for you. You're not the right employee for them, right? Um, But you won't know until you have these conversations. Yeah. I think this is such a practical example for my listeners. So I, I wanna dig even further into the negotiating for a raise example. So if you were to create a roadmap for us, where should people start if they're thinking, okay, I wanna raise up my job? I think that first you have to have, again, this conversation with yourself, right? Have, have real clarity. And a lot of times people just think sort of in that moment what they need. I always think sort of with compensation and with salary negotiations, you should think three years, five years ahead if possible, right? Because 
as you're sitting there again, preparing all these different scenarios, which you absolutely should in, in salary conversations, compensation conversations, you start thinking about where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in three years? And as you then envision how this conversation is going to go, all of a sudden your salary is not the only important thing, right? Things like titles become important. Things like the type of projects you want to be involved in become important. The group that you want to work with. Maybe you want to go to law school, right? So if that's the case, if you're planning for business school or law school in three years, then at some point, maybe you want to look at a more flexible schedule or sort of a tuition reimbursement type of thing if you want to go and take some preparatory classes, right? So as you envision your life um, looking ahead, then you start seeing all these other, these options grow out of your, your thought process. When you go into the salary negotiations or the compensation conversations, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but sort of what to think about additionally, you are now going back to exactly what we were just talking about, which is you can now present options, right? Obviously money is always important, right? But if they say no to that, you're thinking, all right, I have other plans. What about a change in title? What can I do to maybe move into this other group that has these really exciting projects that sort of are, are, are leading to better ROI for our company, right? So then I can tie our profitability to the types of projects I'm involved in, which will give you added sort of quantitative measures. Tuition reimbursement, sick leave, working more from home, having a f- more flexible schedule. So that's, I think, really important psychologically for yourself because again, it's not the no, it's that I have other plans. And so let's work through this together. And for them, right, it's not an easy, salary conversations aren't easy for really anybody, especially if they have a stake in you, right? They don't, they don't necessarily want to lose you, right? So you're so, sort of also sharing with them some of your plans, right? Where you want to be, what you want to do. There's, there's sort of more transparency involved in this. And I think that's, no matter what the outcome of this particular conversation, I think that's a really great dynamic to create in the long run because you're now sort of, it's, it's shared goals, right? That you're working through. Going back, uh, I think the most important thing um, for salary conversations, comp- compensation conversations, or one of the most important is what I think is important for any negotiations that you do is sort of the, the recognition of your worth and your value in personal relationships, and maybe one thing at your job, um, it's not enough to say, I deserve a raise, right? But really to sit there and think, yes, I've been valuable. Let me sort of draw all the ways that I've brought value to this company, right? I work really hard. I've, I've taken up sort of the responsibilities of two other people. And I haven't really even thought about it for myself because I've had my head down and I've just been working. And when you have those conversations with yourself, it both strengthens your own sort of knowledge of your own self-worth, right? So that inner critic sort of dies down a little bit. Now you're sort of becoming much more courageous even and and much more self-assured, but you're also presenting then an argument that has some real sort of data that's attached to it. And so now that becomes uh, an opportunity for storytelling that is powerful, but can be understood sort of from both sides, not just from your own lens. I think it's interesting, the point you brought up about one person now taking on multiple roles. We've seen that a lot in the last few years where your job description was one thing when you entered and agreed to the salary, and now suddenly you absorbed the roles of two, three different people. That's kind of an interesting point of leverage too that you can have saying, okay, this was my job description. And actually now in addition to these things, I've done this and this and this. Right. It was a pandemic, right? We all rolled up our sleeves. You did what you had to, right? And, And I think, you know, for me, it was like head down. I had to sell books. I had to sort of do business development in time when the opportunities had sort of dried up because we didn't know what was coming, right? For companies, it was really the same way, right? So they had layoffs. And and as a result of that, if you were that sort of really valuable employee to this particular group, that was great. You stayed on. But it also could have meant that the people who were laid off 
those were the responsibilities that you took on. And in that moment, you know, when a lot of us had to learn to pivot and just, you know, sort of the grit, right? Just to get through this, we took on these responsibilities. We worked so much harder. And, you know, again, at least for me, and I'd work with a lot of small business owners, I think we didn't even realize the amount of effort that had gone into that, the amount of work that we had done. And so I think that, that again, sitting back and doing this self-reflection ahead of a salary conversation or just because, right? This is that self-worth. This is really recognizing what your value is to yourself, to the people around you. Um, I think that's really a powerful conversation we need to have anyway particularly in times of change and, and, and moments where we, we deal with challenges and, and things that, that we actually very successfully um, get through. To look back and say, what did I do? How much effort did that take? How successful was I at doing that? And I, I don't think we have those conversations with ourselves enough. If you do that and that becomes sort of a way to sort of celebrate yourself, all that you're about, um, your resilience, I think that's such a powerful thing that over time, then it's not hard to go to your boss and have that conversation. Then it's not hard to turn around to your partner and say, I've taken on childcare and the, you know, I'm teaching the kids and I'm making dinner. That doesn't become sort of in your face argument. This becomes the really understanding what you've done and then over time communicating these things and creating those boundaries so you're not burned out. They're all so interconnected. But it always starts with really understanding, acknowledging, and then being able to communicate your self-worth. That's so interesting how these maybe internal doubts that people have really impact their ability to negotiate. Because it's so true. If I don't feel confident that I actually deserve a raise, even if I go in and say, I would like a raise, if it doesn't exude confidence, I'm not going to get it. And having that data, being able to say, I did this and this and this does give me the confidence you know, Erica, I think that's, I think this notion of self-worth and self-value is really at the heart of so many things. We all struggle with it, right? The majority of people are challenged by imposter syndrome, right? This is something that's really a shared experience by so many people, but it's a really lonely place, right? I think imposter syndrome is, is very lonely because in your mind, you know, again, these are the conversations you're having with yourself. You think that, A, nobody really knows you're struggling and you're not going to be the one who's going to tell them. But it's also that there's sort of this shame and guilt associated with it as well, right? So so it's sort of like you're in this, this cocoon of self-doubt, right? And the conversations, that inner critic, that inner judge it is very damaging from so many different, you know, from so many different perspectives in so many different ways. But in, in sort of the kind of negotiations that we're talking about, when you can't convince yourself, when you can't persuade yourself of your value, how on earth are you going to persuade somebody else? It starts with you. That self-belief allows you to tell that story. If you can't tell the story to yourself, if you can't look in the mirror and believe it, persuasion becomes incredibly hard, if not impossible. It's funny because I definitely struggle with imposter syndrome. I mean, there are so many times now in my life where I'm like, what did I do to deserve this? Like, actually, I'm not the smartest person in the room. Like, I should not even be talking to you, right? And I, I struggle with this imposter syndrome. But then actually for business negotiations, I have a character. Like, I put on this- Step into it. Yeah, <laughs> I just step into it. And actually in negotiations, I'm, like, I'm quite good. But it's not, in my personal life negotiations, I feel like I- deal with the imposter syndrome and the doubts. And I don't know. I have, I don't know. <laughs> How would you digest this? I have two characters. <laughs> um, well, let me start with this. So I, I too struggle with this, right? So I'm sitting here going, she's such a superstar. Um, I'm so excited. Such a privilege to, for you to actually have invited me to have this conversation, right? So that's shared. That's very human, I think. And I'll go sort of a step further. There's a certain sense of humility involved in that that I don't necessarily think should be ever lost because that allows us to prepare better. That allows us to sort of stand in a place of, of gratitude, not in the sense of, oh, I'm so grateful, I'm lucky, but I'm so grateful that I've worked hard enough, that I established, established myself enough 
to be able to be here to have this conversation, right? So attributing those things to your your own hard work, right? Your own personal accomplishments. I'm not somebody that has ever been so lucky necessarily. I've worked really hard for everything that I have. And so, and I still have the, oh, I'm so lucky. No, you worked really, really hard, right? Nobody ever served this up for you in a silver platter. And I think that for you, if you can put on this sort of character, which is really interesting because I'm sort of the opposite, where I am my most authentic, maybe the most vulnerable is actually in front of my students, right? In a classroom. Otherwise, sort of in my own personal life, I'm not as open. I'm not as transparent. I'm not as vulnerable. And there's a whole psychology of that. So if one day we have a therapy session, we can sort of go back (laughs) into that. But we choose when our full authentic self sort of shows up, right? And we create these sort of guardrails to ensure that we're not sort of going off the, the path and then not being able to find our way back, right? So we create these sort of boundaries for ourselves, whether it's in our personal life or professional life. But I think what we have to realize is where are those sort of, where is that knowledge transfer, right? What allows me to be so strong, be so, strength, vulnerability is strength, right? Be so authentic in this situation and step into my power and understand sort of at that moment that I'm, I'm worth it, right? So even if this character that you step into, it has to originate somewhere, right? That's sort of the, maybe it's the, the superhero on you, you know, I don't know, like you're, you're reaching, you have to dig in somewhere. Think about that. Like, where do I get that from? Where, why do I have such a strong voice in those moments? And how can I take those opportunities and bring them into my personal life? And why is it so challenging for me to do that in my personal life? Right? What is it about the way I approach these relationships that I feel like there's not enough room for that person, the person that you want to be, the person that is strong, the person that has her opinion and and is is proud of it even, right? Is yeah. courageous enough to express it. When you can create those sort of knowledge transfer, if you will, right? It's this conversation that says, how do I b- bridge that gap? What's keeping me from doing it? But how do I bridge that gap? I think that's really important because then you start thinking about all the reasons why, right? The, you start uncovering things. Nothing we experience now, you know, we get in our own way all the time. I say to people, it's not that you don't know how to negotiate, it's that you get in your own way, right? And when you uncover those things, this is why self-reflection is so good. This is why therapy or coaching may be good. It's because all of these, this baggage, the scars, the wounds, they started a long time ago. This is now habit, right? So I think these 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 conversations are really important and that honesty with yourself first and foremost is is really crucial. That was a really long answer to your question. I sort of went in like 15 no, different directions. No, that's but so interesting because as you were saying that, I think I realized it's not that I have these two characters, one for my personal and one for my business life. I I realize it's actually who I'm advocating on behalf of. If I'm advocating on behalf of myself, I am by nature a people pleaser. I really want to make other people happy and I will sacrifice my own good for other people. If I'm advocating on, on behalf of someone else, I am fiercely advocating for them and I can turn on the character in me that will go after their rights no matter what. And so if it's, you know, I'm advocating on behalf of my friends or my followers or my clients, whoever it is, I only have their best interest at heart and I will do whatever it takes to get them the outcome that they need. Simple example. The other day, I heard one of my followers um, was overcharged by this company. She was actually entitled to a $600 refund. And I have this little community of, of people on Discord. And so she messaged me about it. And I was like, you know what? I have actually worked with this company before. I'm going to go email the heads of this company and say that they need to give you the $600 right. refund. And I didn't care that it would hurt my own personal reputation right. with the company. I, all I cared about was advocating for this person. And of course, I was able to get the $600 <laughs> refund. But it's like, that's the line. Right. If it's on behalf of someone else, right. I turn on a character exactly. and I can just do whatever exactly. I want. Which says, though, that you have to be a powerful negotiator to be able to do that, right? And that's what I'm saying. Like you have all the makings, 
there's a lot of gender dynamics and you know um in in this particular scenario by the way and and i think that that this notion of i can advocate on behalf of anybody and everybody right and i can do a really great job right i'm strong in my stance i'm confident successful right and then when it comes to yourself that's again that's where that the inner judge right that all of that comes in and it goes head to head with this notion of it's not all about me i have to make room for this person right this is i want to make sure that they're happy why is it that we feel like again those two things can't coexist right the the happy you will make your partner happier as well right we are better we give back to the world when we are full right when we're fulfilled and we're not tired and we're not burnt out right so if we actually told ourselves that then maybe just maybe self advocacy and self love will make us more courageous will make you more like that person who's advocating on behalf of somebody else um the other reason why we do that is because we don't want to be judged right we don't want other people to think and especially sort of these gendered roles i don't want them to judge me i don't want to feel greedy right we're so worried about how the world sees us but understand and again imposter syndrome right understand that that's how you see yourself right you are projecting onto somebody else the feelings that you have about yourself it's not greed it's it's you know especially if somebody is invested in you they can understand that you need fulfillment and happiness and why these interests matter to you it's how you communicate that right but again there's there's guilt there's self judgment there's the, you know it you put all of those ex- ingredients together in a pot and it's combustible right that's and unfortunately you're at the the receiving end of of all the sort of the the mistakes and the fallout i so wish that we would really understand and i say we because i'm i'm guilty of this myself that to draw again those boundaries it's not this notion of of rejection for your partner your client it's a no, it's this notion of compassion really compassion for yourself and compassion for that individual because you're saying i can do more for you when i'm fulfilled i can do more for you when i'm not exhausted I can do more for you when when I'm actually sort of addressing some of these uh tasks that I have and these responsibilities I want to fulfill and once I do that once I check those off the to-do list I can come back to you and actually give you more but instead we punish ourselves and we don't look at it as sort of an act of compassion we think about it as sort of conflict will ensue if I do this Super interesting. I have two points that I just want to spit out before I forget and then you can tackle whatever one you want. So one, the gender dynamics thing. So interesting because I was in a very male dominated workforce in at this big law firm and if a man is standing up for himself, he is confident. He knows what he wants. I saw the same thing if a woman stands up for herself, she's aggressive or other worse words, right? And the second completely random thought is I released a video a few days ago about how people need to when they get married still protect themselves financially and be financially independent. And I was thinking about marriage and how marriages will break down and a lot of it comes down to not being 50-50. So it may be that the household responsibilities are not 50-50. Someone feels like they're pulling more weight or it may be that the finances are not 50-50. Someone feels like they're pulling more weight, therefore they're entitled to more say over the money. Someone feels the other side feels a little less secure about their money situation. And all of these breakdowns I realize could probably be summarized as some aspect of the relationship is not 50-50. Right. And maybe the person who has less than 50 didn't hasn't been able to say hey I, I wish we could be closer to 50/50 so those are my two thoughts whatever you want to tackle I don't know if there's I'm not married I've never been married but um you know in all the sort of personal relationships that we have or even um relationships with clients and what have you I don't know if you can achieve that 50/50 balance all the time right and in some ways it may forever be 45 you know 55 right because i just don't see it as being that black and white 
there's give and take, right? There are certain moments in our life when, well, one thing is more important to us. And then at another time where we've let go of some things and something else is more important. I mean, just think about how much we've grown and changed over that. I am a very different person in some ways than I was three years ago or two and a half years ago, right? So I think that this, this notion of an exact balance at all times is very hard to achieve. Instead, I think it's more about sort of the commitment to understanding what's important at that moment during that time, right? And allowing yourself to be able to voice any changes that are happening for you, right? How you've grown, how you've sort of shifted. A lot of sort of studies shows that as curious as we are about sort of people that we're just meeting, we are far less curious about the people that we already know, right? And and I always say, you know, it's those people that actually we we abandon the most in terms of preparing for those negotiations, preparing for those conversations. Because it's, I've, I've been married to you for 10 years. Of course, I know what you're thinking. And the minute you're not curious, right? It all goes back to curiosity. You're not empathetic. You're not open, right? You're sort of filling in all the blanks for that person. That's not fair, right? Again, we change. So I think it's less about creating that. And this is maybe controversial, but I don't know if there's ever a time where it's exact, but it's a commitment to understanding what matters most at that moment and how you realize those things for yourself or your partner and really committing yourself to having those conversations over and over again, right? Because that sense of openness and trust and transparency allows you to avoid the resentment that we feel for that person, right? And by the way, some of those things may be at odds with one another, but even then it takes some sense of compromise, right? So what we commit ourselves to is what's important, the intentionality, as opposed to maybe an exact outcome, mm. right? And then the gender conversation. Or do you want to digest what I just said? You're digesting. I'm digesting. It's so interesting that a lot of what we're talking about does come back to the, one, understanding yourself and what you want so that you don't reach a point where you feel resentment. Because I've felt resentment in my life. And when you feel it, it's almost too late to fix it. Because resentment usually feels, usually means that you feel like someone's taking advantage of you or something's not equal. And then it's, it's almost like, how do you fix that? So how do you, how do you fix it when you're in a scenario where you're already feeling resentment? Resentment because you made decisions thinking that right. it was going to make the other person happy. It's funny because I'll, um, you're so, I mean, you're so right. That's why you don't want to wait until that point. Right. But um, as I was writing my book, for example, it was really cathartic in some ways because it allowed me to revisit some of those relationships and some of those moments, right? And, you know, I even would change that chapter or that paragraph a million times in my head until I actually arrived at a place that it wasn't full of resentment, but actually really full of understanding. And it's unfortunate that it's the aftermath, right? But the truth is that, and I believe this wholeheartedly, to understand that nobody can take anything from you that you don't give. Nobody can erase the boundaries that you want to honor and you stand in. You know, to, to think that way is so, um, you're giving away so much of your power and so much of your voice, right? So instead of waiting two years, the relationship is broken up and, and you know, you resent the person, you resent yourself. And this is far easier said than done, obviously. But if you, you're you sort of doing this act of sort of self-reflection constantly, right? And and you're allowing yourself even to, to better understand what's happening, then you may start honoring your values, right? You may stand up to, and I don't want to say stand up because it's not confrontation, but you're, you're speaking it, you're conversing, you're having these conversations. And, and again, you're drawing those boundaries, right? That allows you to not resent somebody in the aftermath because it's preventative, right? But once you go too far, then you do what I did, which is, you know, the relationship is now gone or, or that partnership broke up. And, you know, better late than never, I guess. But you you grow from that. And it still feels empowering because now even in the aftermath, you're saying the way I could have prevented that was if I had stood up for myself. The way I could have prevented that was if I had honored myself and I didn't. And that was the result. 
you learn from those mistakes, right? But but again, it's when we don't want to, maybe again, it's guilt and shame and all that. Mm-hmm. When we don't give ourselves the courage to speak our voice for whatever reason, that's really where burnout happens, resentment happens, divorce happens, right? The, the damage to those relationships inherently because you're damaged. It's so interesting when you said the word burnout, I thought of how burnout happens because people aren't acknowledging their boundaries and making it clear at work. They're allowing their boss to keep them till 9, 10 p.m. every day. And if more people took your advice and <laughs> honestly like thought more hey, about- Hey, Maury, take your own advice. Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> These things are all, it it really, it is like, if you peel away everything that I'm saying at the end of the day, it's, it's how we value ourselves. Right. But, you know, burnout at work, for example, what's to say that your boss actually wants you to work 14 hours, right? You're doing that because you want to prove something to them. You are afraid of losing your job. It's the pandemic. People are getting laid off. You're having all those conversations with yourself, right? There's all these assumptions that you're making. Um, So those assumptions may not be true. You may go to your boss and they may say, I'm so glad you're going to take this time for yourself, right? Or it stresses me out when you email me at one o'clock in the morning because I feel like you need me to respond to you, right? So please, right? Like stop emailing after seven. Like when we start assuming, uh, then it goes nowhere really fast, right? But when you can communicate and not feel afraid, right? Not feel afraid to have these conversations and not think the minute I do this, they're going to fire me or they're going to think I'm not you know, performing at my best or I'm ignoring work. I'm, I'm not prioritizing my job. When I mean, you stop assuming and telling yourself those stories and actually, because that comes from a place of fear, right? Scarcity, right? If you actually address it and have those conversations, the stories we make up in our heads are infinitely, infinitely worse than the reality of things, right? And and it's like snowball effect, right? You start having a conversation, next thing you know, you've been fired and you'll never get a job again, right? It just goes nowhere fast. Have the conversations with yourself first. Again, tell yourself the story, convince yourself, but then have the conversation so the the burden doesn't come later of resentment and burnout and all that. Yeah. And one of the things you talk about too is how learning how to be a better negotiator, it's not a skill that you're born with or not born with. It's a skill that you have to just practice. It's like right. a muscle, right? right? Absolutely. It's a learned skill. That's why we can get better and better and better through practice. And, you know, along with that comes, I wholeheartedly believe there's not one type of a great negotiator we come in all different forms because it's really about humanity at the end of the day it's about who we are and how we connect with people how we connect with the world and how we connect with ourselves and so if we realize that this is something you can grow into that actually we're better people are far better negotiators than they give themselves credit for right and again you do this all the time so how can you possibly be bad at it can you get better? Everybody can get better, right? But we criticize ourselves so much with negotiations, right? People come into my class, they're like, oh, I'm a horrible negotiator. I'm like, you're a mom, right? How, you're an entrepreneur. How, how is that even possibly true? Now, your kids may get the best of you sometimes, right? But you have so much practice, right? And have that conversation with yourself. What is it that I do there that's successful? Why can't I bring that to work, right? the dual personalities that you were talking about. We don't give ourselves credit. We don't allow ourselves to think, okay, let me learn from that mistake. I can only get better. We just all of a sudden say, I'm not good at this. So I never want to negotiate a car car deal again. Let let my husband do it. Or um, I'm really horrible at this. So I'm so afraid of asking for, you know, a discount from AT&T or, you know, whatever it is, right? So giving ourselves more credit comes from this place of understanding that, yeah, you have you have far too too much practice to think you're not somewhat good at this. Where are the places that you feel you have deficiencies and address those rather than sort of disavowing you know all things negotiations forever and ever and ever. We don't do that. It, it's really interesting how we just 
we can't sort of applaud ourselves for our successes in negotiations. We just always think about all the the bad conversations, the hurtful conversations, the divorces, the bad contracts, losing money, right? Those are the only things that we remember. But in fact, there's a lot of successes that we can actually reflect on and learn from along the way. Yeah. And with the negotiation, practicing negotiation thing, there's so many little negotiations that people can do in their daily lives Every day. that have no, there's no potential loss. I mean, right. if you go to AT&T and try to negotiate your phone bill, <laughs> the best outcome is they'll say, okay, we'll cut your phone bill down by $20. Right. The worst is they say no, but you still got some practice in, right. you know? Right. Again, it's the defeat, right? That sort of, we reflect on so much that they far outweigh any kind of success and all the little things, you know, like what did I do there that was so successful that maybe I can do here. We don't do that because we're sitting there sort of wallowing in how you did so poorly when you went and bought your car and you just know that you got the worst deal because you came back home and you looked up the Kelly Blue Book values and you were, I've been had, right? Okay. So next time, look at the Kelly Blue Book values (laughs) ahead of time, right? (laughs) this is not the be all end all, right? What else have you done that has really worked and how can you replicate those things? Yeah, our scars become like tattoos for us, right? These are not things that we think we we can learn from. We just carry the burden of them forever. Whereas our successes, we tend to forget and not celebrate. That's so true. And the way, and also the words people say about us People can say a hundred nice things about you, but you'll remember the one person who criticized something about you. Yeah, forever. Forever. And when they compliment you, you know, it's very hard for you to say thank you, right? Because it's, it's kind of like cognitive dissonance, right? The story that you've told yourself of yourself, right? The, the way you see yourself in the mirror, right? The way you feel about yourself is negative, it's not really reflective of who you really are, but that's what you believe about yourself. So when somebody gives you a compliment, you know, let's say you you don't feel good about yourself. Let's say you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm fat or I don't, you know, I wish I could lose weight. The minute somebody says, oh, you look great, right? What have you done? Instead of saying thank you, because at that moment you're thinking, do they want something from me, right? Like, are they lying? Is it just... Are they just trying to be nice to me today? The way you saw yourself is negative enough that what you hear, again, it's co- it's like cognitive dissonance. It's not, it's not reflective of what your truth is. So you kind of push it away. Whereas the minute somebody criticizes you, oh yeah, that's in line with your truth. Um, and that's why sort of we, we, we take it on and we hold on to it and we reflect on it and we can't let it go. Um, because it, again, it starts with how we see ourselves. I think that's a great message for people that negotiation is a skill that can be learned. What about emotional intelligence? That's such an important part of negotiation. And I feel less confident that emotional intelligence can be learned. What do you think? Oh, it can absolutely be learned. Really? Oh, absolutely. So just let's look at emotional intelligence from this perspective. Um, Somebody who is constantly distracted, right? When you're in conversations with people, you're staring at your cell phone or, you know, you're, you're never really present, right? In your life, you miss a lot of things, right? And you do it and don't even know it. Right. A lot of times, yeah, you know, I always remind my students, like, put your cell phones away. There's no technology in this room. And it's really uncomfortable for a lot of people because it's like a lifeline that's been cut off. And then they leave it on the desk. So I'm like, no, 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 not just turn it off, just put it away. Right. Because we're just as distracted because now you're thinking about what you're missing. Right. Which is so crazy. But if you understand whether it's, you miss something and it damages the outcome of the negotiations. Or maybe somebody says, I I can't even have this conversation with you because obviously it's not very important to you because you keep looking at your text, right? So you've damaged whatever that relationship is. That's too late. But if, again, you sort of have some amount of self-reflection, you're thinking, well, where did I go wrong, right? And, And really take that hard look. You quickly realize they feel that way because my cell phone was on. They feel that way because when when I got texted, like I I 
had to look at it, right? And it was in the midst of them telling me something really important, right? So I messaged to them that they're not really as important as this is. It takes self-reflection. It takes some honesty with yourself. It, it even maybe takes you to ask what happened, right? What, what did I do that didn't sit well with you? And that person becomes inherently more emotionally intelligent because they realize that they miss the person being angry at them. They missed how the person reacted at that moment when you picked up your cell phone that you missed potentially, right? What you were messaging to them. So you're not even aware of your own feelings and your own actions, right? This is a really, and I understand very sort of superficial way of talking about it, but you learn, right? And so I believe that you can become far more emotionally intelligent because you understand that that we you miss things when you're not, right? When we can't use all our sensory skills, right? To read a person, to be in a conversation. It's so disruptive. You know, if you look at this even from a strategic perspective, you know, you're losing, right? This is this is a real loss. Um, both maybe again in the damaged relationship, but how much less you are experiencing in your life, right? You're not even really present in that. So we do learn. I think you have to be really, really open and and self-reflective to be able to do that and then hone in on the things that you can do to be better and be more aware, right? Maybe it's that you're a horrible listener and you've been told that many times and you've brushed it off when it's like your own personal relationships. Then you're like, okay, so now everybody is telling me this. This might actually be true. So how can I be a better listener? And then you work on that, right? Because that's an element of being emotionally intelligent. So there's so many different elements to being more emotionally intelligent that I think all of those things can be learned and improved upon that as a whole in its totality, emotional intelligence is absolutely learned. Um, and we're always learning by the way. I'm convinced actually. <laughs> I'm convinced with that example. Now I feel like, okay, emotional intelli- intelligence can be learned. What What's something when you first started this, um, when you first started to study the art of negotiation, you came in believing that you now believe is not true? So many things I would say. I honestly, you know, let's go back to sort of teaching, right? I I thought that it had to be taught a certain way, right? That it was sort of the strategy and and the foundations. And um, that's how I had to communicate and deliver this information to be in line, more in line with how it that story was being told, right? By academics and podcasts and, and books. And then when I sort of really reflected on the negotiations, the way we started this conversation, right? The the negotiations that I've had in my life, it changed the way I saw negotiations as a whole because I realized that it wasn't just those transactions that I had done, right? The conversations about money or contracts or what have you, that this was so much a part of my being, right? My every experience, that sense of, we do in fact do this all the time, that it can't be taught prescriptively because we're all so different. This is human experience, right? So you're not baking a cake. You're, every person is different. Every relationship is different. Everybody's values are different. So, you know, just that knowledge, that understanding changed everything for me because then I I stopped thinking that you had to be a certain way or act a certain way to be successful. Uh, I stopped thinking that, that, you know, there was no malleability or shades of gray when it came to outcomes, perhaps, right? You know, we always say like, oh, if you got more money out of this deal, that's, that's a win. Well, is it? Because what, how did it maybe damage the other person, right? What was, what was the outcome of that? Or if you sold this item for less, you were taken. Well, were you? Because you also built a really great relationship in the in sort of the process of this this conversation this negotiations so that person is now going to be a return customer and that's going to bring you value in perpetuity right so the looking at negotiations from a really black and white perspective and understood that actually the beauty of it all was 
absolutely in the shades of gray, right? That that people are different, conversations are different, that it's elegant. It's like I always talk about it. It's like this elegant back and forth. It's this dance. I'd say that was the biggest thing. Second biggest thing. I know this is a long answer, but second biggest thing was that where emphasis should lie in this process of negotiations. It wasn't that transaction, right? It was absolutely sort of what we do before that, which is when you meet somebody, when, you know, I call it information exchange, but it's first meeting somebody or if it's your partner, the sitting down with the intentionality of having this conversation, the humanity, right? The, the being open to learning about this person, not because you're about to go through a contract discussion with them, but because you're just genuinely interested in this person, right? Those all come before you even start a transactional conversation. And when I really got that piece of it, I realized that, well, the reason why so many people don't like negotiations is because the transactional conversations without knowing that person, without the human connection, without the empathy, without sort of those, the rapport being built are these really tough conversations that are actually truly black and white, right? You have more money, you have less money. You can do it, you can't do it. That step before it allows for sort of the, that, that, the back and forth, right? The, the humanity, the connection to that person. So I would say that's probably the second biggest thing. And it's probably what I love teaching the most because then I believe that most people are actually much more comfortable in conversations. That's sort of a, the comfortable place. The transaction is not. And when they realize that they can actually spend more time there because of that, they'll spend less time on the, the actual transaction. The negotiations all of a sudden becomes just a conversation. And this is far more comfortable. And I think that changes everything, right? It's, it's a process. It's, it's not fast. It's not meant to be efficient. It's meant to be sort of a slow walk. Um, and you're walking sort of side by side with this person. Nobody's trying to run ahead all the time and force something down somebody's. It's a shared experience. I think those are those are probably the biggest things. And again, it changed not only the way I teach, but the way I see it. Sort of this is sort of my love affair with it. Really like where it all kind of starts for me is the humanity of it. So for the last 18 years, you've been teaching negotiation at Wharton. If I were your student at the end of the year, the final exam, what would cause Professor Mori to fail me? What would what would be the key points to you that, okay, Erica clearly did not learn anything in my class? It's really never happened. There's not a final exam. Um, there's, they do a paper at the end of the semester, but I'm sitting here thinking that this is the privilege of having taught, as long as I have, it's sort of such an incredible institution. Um, you know, I, I'll talk about my undergrads first. At some point in the semester, the outcome of the exercises don't mean as much to them. They never meant anything to me from the first place. Like I don't, I don't grade them on how they do in these like negotiation role plays, right? I, I always say it's the process, not the outcome that matters. But at some point in the semester, for some it happens earlier, for some it happens later, they get what the class was all about. And we are collectively so transparent with one another. It's such a safe place. We're all so committed in a way that feels like an investment. Maybe that's why nobody really ever fails because I sense that they got it. I sense that this is about life. This isn't about, so it's not a math class or anything like that. It's sort of this journey that they've taken and they grow into something. And some people get it again, they get it immediately because this is a place that they can go and be open and learn about themselves. And for some people they're kicking and screaming for some time because being open and being vulnerable is very difficult, but when they get it, they really get it. So how can I fail people for that? Right? Like we cry at the last day of class, right? We are, um, we're so deeply connected and that, Seriously, when I say we cry, we we cry at the last day of class. But it's about sort of love and connection and and this realization that we just went through all of these things together. You know, think think about sort of the pandemic, right? All these difficult moments, whatever the stages in their life, we've grown together collectively. We've experienced things collectively. I've learned about them. They've learned about me. 
there's acceptance. Unless you've just never done any of the assignments from beginning to end because the assignments are aligned with their growth. They do journal entries. They talk about what the mistakes they made, what they learned. Unless you do none of those or you miss classes because class is mandatory, then okay. But as long as you're committed and you come to class and you're committed to your own personal growth, then that's all I need. I would love to sit in one of your classes one day. <laughs> Can I come one day? <laughs> come, don't come the last day. You'll be like, why are all these people crying? What is <laughs> what is happening here? Um, but yeah, it's it's um, it is it's magic. It really is. It's it's unbelievable. And I I threatened to stop teaching in undergrads because every Tuesday for you know the entire spring semester and I have to commute to Philadelphia because I live in DC. I've probably been threatening for myself for like 10 years. Like this is taking too much time. It's, you know, I'm so full. My heart is so full during the semester that it's it's a hard habit to break. It really is. <laughs> so we have a little closing tradition. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Maury Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away from this podcast being able to say, Maury taught me this? That it's so important to understand your own self-worth um, that that the reason why this is far more important than knowing negotiation strategy of some sort or you know memorizing what you're supposed to say to something somebody in a negotiations or you know mirroring or all those things that were you know are often taught that it really begins and ends with you um, because if you can't change, right? That, that conversation with yourself, if there is sort of a lack of self-love, self-confidence, self-belief, if that narrative is negative, you'll never be successful because it's so reflective of the goals that you set for yourself. Um, if you don't think you have any power, you don't have power, you don't have leverage because it's, it's sort of perception based. People will see that. If you don't think you deserve, you'll never ask. Um, and so I think spend more time looking inward for the answers than look outward for strategy or solutions, right? It's, it all starts and ends with you. You are your best resource in terms of what you need to be successful in negotiations. Clear those cobwebs, right? Get out of your own way. Um, and then you will see that, that really, I, I it's magic. Like it, everything changes in your relationships and your negotiations and your work life. But you have to, that sort of the love and the empathy and compassion you give yourself is far exceeds anything else. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, Maury has a book called How to Harness the Power of Connection to Negotiate Fearlessly. And I'll put the link in the show notes. And I have a huge favor to ask. It would mean a lot if you could take a moment to leave a review for the podcast. Even just one sentence is perfect. It really helps support the work that we're doing. Thank you for spending your time with me today. And I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.